and welcome to Cash Chats, the podcast from Be Clever With Your Cash that takes you through some of the biggest money stories of the week. I'm Amelia Murray, Andy's on holiday this week, but we've got a really special guest, Martin James. Martin's a consumer expert. You've probably seen him on TV. He's on Rip Off Britain, Steph's Pack Lunch. You might have heard him on the radio, or perhaps you've read one of his newspaper columns in The Times or The Mirror, among other places. He's also co-host of the new podcast, Bread and Honey. Martin is basically everywhere sharing his insights and knowledge, and we go way back. Hi, Martin, and welcome. (laughs) Hello, Amelia. Let's pretend that we don't know each other and do this this from the top like the professionals we are. (laughs) We should have done that at the start. (laughs) Too late now. (laughs) Um, Some of the stories we're looking at in Your Money this week are criminal gangs stealing 20 smartphones a day, Amazon making sneaky changes to the minimum order, and what salary makes someone rich. We'll also be sharing this week's successes from you guys. This is episode 396 of Cash Chats. So before I start with the first story, which is a really good one, just a quick reminder to take a meter reading this week. The new energy price cap comes into play on the 1st of July, and it's fallen by 7%. So if you submit a meter reading before or on the 1st of July, it will stop your supplier from estimating your usage and potentially assuming you've used more energy at the higher rate than you actually have. Right, so on to the first story I want to talk about this week. This is one about criminal gangs stealing people's smartphones and then their money. So there's been an interview on this morning with a gang leader and he was telling everyone that he's got a team of four teenagers on scooters who steal 20 smartphones a day. The idea is that they can get into the phone, access your banking apps and then steal your savings. It's really scary. He claims the most he's got from one phone is about 40 to 50 grand in about half an hour. Um, Martin, what is going on with this? Well, do you know, really, this is one of the things that actually, once we stop talking to people, it becomes terrifying. I'm going to drop a few facts into this story that will scare you a little bit more, but it's worth it. It is worth it, trust me, because um, it's things that you can sort out really, really easily that will help you. Be, um, if you are targeted, it will mean that you aren't so susceptible to fraud. But actually, one of the things that we need to actually get used to in this world of AI, when we're told about complex technology and, you know, the black web and all of these kind of things, or the dark web even, let's call it what it's actually supposed to be called, um, is we tend to believe that, you know, fraud is super technical, and actually, most of the time, it's really low tech. And this particular story is about shoulder surfing, which is basically the art of having a peek over the shoulder, literally, so that they can see when your phone number or your identity code is put into a phone. It's exactly the same as going to a busy bar and somebody watches when you put your PIN number in for when you have to put your card into the machine and then half an hour later nicks the card out of your wallet. It's ridiculously low tech. But if you think about it, that opens up a world on your mobile phone. It's not the value of your phone so much. It's the data and the information that's inside of it. Now, if they've seen you enter in your five or six digit code, which you'll have to do every now and then with most smartphones, then the fact of the matter is they can access pretty much anything and that's when things start to get a little bit dystopic yeah you're right so it's no longer about the handset you know when people used to nick your phone it was like they wanted to resell it but it's actually now really hard to resell phones in the UK um and it's actually I mean I've done some work in in this area uh which which will come next week when the stories are published but essentially the guy was saying He was not only, you know, it's not only about the shoulder surfing, he's looking for people on the phone, you know, walking through the West End on the phone, not not concentrating because then your phone's open. So it's even easier. And then once someone's in your phone, it's really easy to like reset your passwords because, you know, most people don't have their email account um, blocked by a password. And that's where the reset link gets sent. You're getting the text notifications, the two-step verification sent to a text message, which they can then access. Um, It's really frightening. And I think with this interview, I watched it. The advice was really strange to me. So apparently the gang leader was saying, um, you know, the best way to avoid this happening to you is to buy like an Apple Watch and some Bluetooth earphones so that you can answer your phone without getting your phone out. Um, and I was like, all right, so we're going to spend hundreds of pounds to protect ourselves. That was, yeah, a bit, a bit jarring for me. But, but honestly, like it's happened to a friend of mine and I've seen the videos of phones getting swiped when someone's just walking along the street and someone on a scooter comes up and just nicks it out of their hand and then drives off. And so, you know, and my uncle had his phone 
on the table in a pub and someone came in and stole it there. So it's it's not necessarily a new crime, but it's definitely on the rise. Um, and, you know, I don't want this to happen to any anyone else. But if it does, you know, report it to your bank, report it to the police. You'll need the crime reference if you want to claim it on insurance, if your phone is covered um, and change your passwords, because at the very least, you know, the Apple ID or the equivalent on an Android um, and your email that will hopefully block the access to resetting the other passwords for your more sensitive data and your banking apps. You hit the nail on the head there, actually, Amelia, because if you think about it, you don't even need to spot somebody's code. If somebody grabs a phone off you uh, as they speed past on a bike or a scooter, your phone's already unlocked. So all they have to do is keep that screen open. Now, the Achilles heel for most of us is our email address. And I'll tell you why. That's because we've fallen into a pattern, most of us, because we struggle to remember passwords and other important details of emailing ourselves. So maybe you're going away on holiday and you're a little bit worried about losing your passport. Lots of people actually take photos of their passport and email it to themselves. Um, And rather uncleverly, I know because I did it myself, um, they call the email password. Now, if I hit your phone and it's open and I go into your email, all I have to type into the search drive is passport or passwords, and chances are I'll find a spreadsheet or a photo or some information that gives me the access codes to every single one of your personal and most private details or even your financial details. So actually, just locking down your email properly, or if you're worried about forgetting things, emailing yourself using assumed names, maybe you know if you do email your passport details to yourself, Put it in, you know, Auntie Beryl's birthday party, 1978, which isn't going to come up with your fraudster. But then you'll, as long as you remember what to look for, you'll be able to find that information. But if you lock down your email, that's actually the entrance level for most fraudsters to get in. So it's little simple things that you can do like that. When I explain that passport, uh, passport thing to people um, on the telly, virtually every single person presenting and all of the crew were mortified because they've all done it. So you can sort that out right now while you're watching this program. Just go into your your phone, delete those emails. Brilliant. Um, And as I said, I've got some articles coming out in the next few weeks uh, with much more on how to protect your phone and your money. Now, I'm not saying Amazon's the equivalent of a pickpocket, but it has introduced some sneaky changes this week to its minimum delivery. So Martin, what's happened there? Oh, gosh. Well, Amazon, like many of these um, disruptor companies, um, have a a very simple and devastating business model. Basically, they dominate the entire market. And once they've got the market, they do what they like. And uh, Amazon have been up to quite a few things recently. They've been increasing the prices uh, of a number of things. They've increased their Prime membership. They started charging people extra if they don't want advertisements on the streaming of uh, the TV. And now... When you order things on Amazon, one of the reasons why they dominated the market so much was because they would give you free deliveries um, and actually make that whole process as simple as possible. But without fanfare, they've increased the minimum order price to £35 for free deliveries. That means anything under that you'll have to pay if you're not a Prime member. And that's gone up from £25. So that's quite a big jump. And you might think, well, you know, Amazon have been subsidising this for all these years. They've not been doing it for their own benefit. What they've basically been doing is dominating the market to the point that where we're so used to using them, we're inclined to not give up. So we're kind of stuck with them to a certain degree, unless you make a real concerted effort to not use Amazon anymore. So it's yet another sneaky price rise. And the only way to fight back is to vote with your feet. But are you ready to get rid of Amazon? Well, exactly. I mean, essentially, it's a, it, you have to spend 40% more to get this free delivery. Um, and actually, you know, I'm, I'm with, yeah, and, and with the Prime, so you can usually get free delivery if you've got Amazon Prime, but do you want to pay £95 a year? Um, you can get low value items, you can collect them for free from a pickup location like an Amazon Locker, but you can't do it for everything. And there's been quite a lot of customer backlash here, but do you think it's going to change anything? No, because Amazon don't care, because they are too big to care. Uh, they often argue they're too big to police themselves as well, which is why you can find fraudsters lurking around um, on the account or some very questionable products and some very fake reviews. Uh, we've all had to learn to be a little bit cynical when using Amazon um, for precisely these reasons. But this should really make us stop and pause and think, because this is actually a major change, as you said, you know, um, I'm glad you worked out. It was a 40 percent increase. Matt, is not my forte. Um 
But the, the fact of the matter is that's a big jump, and we haven't been informed of this. Now, Amazon has introduced the one-click checkout, which is all designed to get you to buy for things with buy things with one click without really thinking about whether you want it want to or not or whether it's a good idea. And of course, this isn't going to be obvious on that if you just clicked a button. So the whole thing is very sneaky. And I would really, really encourage people, wherever possible, if not to completely ditch Amazon, to look at the things that they can maybe buy from their local high street, things that they don't need to be buying um, from Amazon, and go and buy them from somewhere else instead. Um, these big companies have decimated our high streets. And now that they've got all of our attention, they suddenly want to start charging us for the privilege. And the only way to deal with that is to stop using them. And on top of this sneaky new kind of change from Amazon, which is designed to basically get more money from people, there's also rumours it's going to start charging people $7.99 a month to use a new version of Alexa. So where, where have these rumours come from? <laughs> this is such a good story. Um, this has been swirling around in the industry for, for quite a while. Sometimes you find that big companies actually leak uh, these rumours themselves just to test the waters. Yeah. <laughs> well, not unlike our governments, I would never suggest that they would do mm -hmm. such a thing. But um, this is um, something that's kind of been doing the rounds for a little while. What we're talking about here is um, potential charges initially in America for um, an additional um, Alexa AI service. So I'm hearing anything from, you know, like four quid to about eight quid for this additional charge. Now, this fascinates me because actually... All of the um, evidence suggests that we've fallen out of love with smart speakers. The great British public has started to suspect that maybe Alexa and Siri are listening in and gossiping about us to their masters. So actually, there's been a big slump in the sale of things like smart speakers, which is why they're always on sale um, and Black Friday. So this is a really strange move um, from Amazon, and maybe it's because they're trying to recoup a bit of money. But effectively, this would allow um, a new and improved Alexa where you wouldn't have to say, Alexa, play Eurovision. Other song contests are available. Um, if you wanted to find something, you'd simply have to mention what it was that you wanted and it would understand and find the information that you need. But we as a public are already deeply sceptical and concerned about the impact of AI. And I think it would be an extremely foolish move for Amazon to launch something so blatantly. But as we were just talking about with that last story, who is to say that they're not introducing it on the slide bit by bit right now? Yeah, this, I mean, I'm not, I don't use Alexa, like we have it, my boyfriend uses it to set timers when he's cooking, whereas I just put it on my phone, I don't need to ask for a service. Um, and when I have used it, she's either not got the answer that I need, or she's not understood me. So I just think maybe Alexa's too sassy for me anyway, so <laughs> I wouldn't be paying <laughs> <laughs> because I don't really care for it when it's free. Um, but on the topic of price rises, the next story is about the increase in the cost of mortgages for first-time buyers. So first-time buyers are now paying more than £1,000 a month, which is an over 60% increase since the last election. So back in 2019, it was £667 a month. And if we look at wages, I mean, they've only increased by 27% in the same time period. So Martin, what's going on there? Well, there are lots of things that are affecting mortgages, but let's focus in on kind of some of the main ones. Um, interest rates are at ridiculous levels, you know, that with Bank of England holding um, the base rate at 5.25%. That basically means that the mortgage lenders, who in some instances have behaved appallingly, are dropping offers onto the market, they're withdrawing them, they're panicking, they're getting ludicrous prices that are effectively preventing any first-time buyers from entering into the market. Now, for existing buyers, you know, friends of mine have actually left London because they can't afford to pay for their mortgages over here. So they've actually downsized and moved up north. And these are people who already have a considerable amount of assets in their home already. Um, it's becoming increasingly impossible for first-time buyers uh, to get uh, even through the door, so it's literally to speak. Um, it's incredibly hard to find um, a deposit, given the uh, the prices at the moment. And this is just more misery. On top of all of that as well, we've still got ludicrous rental prices, which are also killing anyone's chances of saving up a deposit in the first place. So all of this is super depressing. I'm really sorry, everyone listening. I don't have an easy answer to this one. And unfortunately, I don't see a solution in the immediate future. Yeah. And if we look at, you know, the average cost of the first time buyer home, that's increased by 19 percent. 
And, you know, in the Northwest, which is kind of surprising, like there's been the biggest increase of 33% for these first time buyer homes. And, you know, it goes without saying London is the most expensive place, but the properties for first time buyers are costing more than £500,000, which is crazy. Um, And, you know, I was reading the article and it was saying these first time buyers are having to compromise by buying smaller properties or extend their mortgage uh, to get the lower monthly payment. But it's, you know, they're going to suffer in the long run when they pay more overall. And we have seen three lenders, HSBC, NatWest and Barclays, all cut rates this week. But they're so small, it doesn't make any difference in like the wider scheme of things. And, you know, we are still waiting for this cut or potential cuts in the Bank of England base rate. But yeah, is there is there anything people can do? I know you said it's a bit uh, bleak out there, but is there anything people can do at the moment? It's I've spoken to a lot of uh, mortgage brokers who are absolutely despairing um, at the moment. All I can suggest is if you do have enough money coming in to be able to put some aside, the one advantage of these, these times that we're in at the moment is we do have some quite good interest rates. If you don't want to take any risks, with investments and certainly kind of investments are a more long-term approach if you want to get decent returns you might be able to get some money back you might be able to use kind of some of the um uh, the ISA offers to so you're not locking your money away for too long but I would leave any planning for the next year ahead it's worthwhile bearing in mind exactly that you know world events can have an impact on th- things like inflation as well and we are entering extremely unstable times you don't have to um, get me to tell you about some of the uh, quite tricky things that are on the horizon um, in the coming months and year. So I don't think we're going to see any stabilising for the moment. So I'd say focus on stockpiling your money um, and making that money work for you um, rather than trying to desperately to get onto the housing ladder and being saddled with a 40-year mortgage, which is going to cost you an absolute fortune. And you'll also have to pay exit fees to get out of that early if interest rates drop. So look at the bigger picture at the moment. Don't let it get to you um, and just try and make it through the next year. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, we're all trying to cope with the cost of things going up, including children. Um, New research from Virgin Money suggests that 54% of parents have given their kids a pocket money pay rise because of an increase in prices. I mean, I love this story because at least we don't need to say, will somebody think of the children? Um, Because parents are. I mean, it's saying the average weekly amount is £9.33. I mean, I'd love to know how much parents are increasing the kids' pocket money by. But also, what are the ch- what are the children spending it on? Like, did you get pocket money? Um, I did, yes, but that was you know back in eighteen fifty seven. So I was largely working the sweep uh, during that time and working working behind a loom. Um, so no, no, the um, yeah, pocket money was very tokenistic at, at at the time. You know, there'll be lots of people of a certain age listening to this uh, going. Well, nine pound thirty-three. That's that sounds outrageous. Um, I would simply say to to those people, go down to a supermarket and have a look at how much a single chocolate bar or a packet of crisps costs. Um, you will be outraged. Uh, the the increase in prices because we tend to kind of gloss over what we buy in a big shop um, or we buy multi packs of things. We tend not to kind of see the type of things that kids might be actually purchasing in their own right. You know, some Pokemon stickers. Um, a gear or some uh, some chocolate or some of the bits and pieces but it's actually really really expensive this is very much in line with the 50p that I used to get as I said back in 1850 um, so it is very um, you know it, I think parents haven't gone mad this isn't a, a whole aren't the children of today all spoiled um, story it's simply a reflection of how expensive everything is but there are lots of things that you know lots of parents are telling me that they're using kind of special children saver cards you know those plastic cards that you can kind of load up so kids can actually get used to managing their finances um even if they can't physically see the money this is a big concern of you know not having physical money anymore is that it's hard to keep on top of what you're actually spending but there are actually lots of tools that kids can use to actually help them understand where their money's going where it's gone um and how quickly they spent it so in some ways this is an, a story about how technology can actually maybe make things better for a new generation, though it's certainly not going to make them cheaper. You can tell I didn't get pocket money, which is why I'm so bitter about it. I'm one of those people. (laughs) (laughs) All your mother told me, Amelia. (laughs) No, what what I do get, so my granny, um, for our birthday, she gives us £10 for every year of our age. So it goes up by £10 every year, which is really generous. (laughs) 
<laughs> which is really generous when you're as old as me. Um, but I remember my older sister kind of complaining. She's like, well, it's not keeping in line with inflation, is it? And I was like, oh my goodness, be grateful. <laughs> um, which brings us nicely onto our last story, but which is about feeling rich and uh, the salary that you need to, to feel wealthy. And before we go into this, Martin, a personal question, what salary would make you feel rich? <laughs> well, I've lived in London for 25 years. I'm from Manchester and I'm from a working class background. But let me tell you, after 25 years in London, quite a bit of money would be required to make me feel rich. And I'd, I'd definitely say way over £150,000 because money goes so quickly in London. And that will, you know, that's what you need to get a £500,000 starter mortgage for a two-bedroom flat in London. So I would say minimum of 150000 Okay, interesting. So there's this survey by the recruitment company Indeed, and they are suggesting that you need £100,000 a year to be considered rich, but the sweet spot is £96,000 a year for the average person to feel rich. Um, and combined households would need £115,500 per year they've also done a regional breakdown and this is quite surprising because scotland had the highest bar at 106,520, which is more than people in london were wanting to feel rich um and yorkshire and the humber had the lowest bar at 80 just over eighty six thousand. they also looked you know they were comparing how much people earned now to how much they would need to feel rich um so people already earning 100 grand said they would need 165 and 22% of those earning less than 15 grand would feel rich with 20,000 pounds, which is really interesting to me. It's like, you know, it's all the benchmarking, isn't it? And and if you look at, you know, if you're on 100 grand, you're in the top 5% of earners in the UK. And, you know, the average salary is almost 35 grand. So it's all kind of relative, isn't it? Um, but I also am quite interested in what do you think makes someone feel rich? I think, uh, I mean, I'm fascinated by this survey because uh, I mean, one of the things that we should take away from it is the fact that actually it shows that the vast majority of people living in the United Kingdom don't have, you know, ridiculous aspirations. They they have uh, aspirations, you know, to just earn enough money so that they would feel comfortable. I think this is, we're combining kind of feeling rich with not worrying about having to pay the bills. And maybe for lots of people, that's simply because they've, struggled to get through the last few years in the cost of living crisis so they know that they have a minimum amount of money that they need to break even so doubling that actually makes them feel a little bit more secure um so actually i think that's why we're not seeing these ridiculously high um prices um so it all depends on individual circumstances and what they're actually worried about but what this also tells us as we were seeing from that mortgage dis discussion that we just had is our expectations of what rich is versus what we need to buy a really basic, basic home is completely different. So even if people were super rich, they would still struggle to actually get onto the average price, uh, house price, which is around £232,000 across the whole of the UK. So if £96,000 is uh, considered to be rich and the best mortgage you're going to get is going to be about 3.5% uh, of your earnings, then you're barely scraping an entry-level home. And I think that's going to be a major concern for whoever is running the country in the next few months. Yeah, and, and I think, I guess, like with, with the whole, the perception of wealth and then the feeling of wealth, you know, I've, I've looked into this before where, you know, people who are on high, high salaries comparably end up not feeling wealthy at all because, you know, the whole lifestyle creep thing, you know, you know, you earn more, you might start spending more, you move to a bigger house, your mortgage increases, you might get a cleaner or a dog walker, um, your, your outgoings increase, you might want to put the kids in private school. Um, and then suddenly you don't have the disposable income or the money in the bank that you were used to and you feel kind of stretched, even though your assets and your outgoings have increased. Um, and, you know, and I remember talking to someone and she was like, we earn much more than our neighbour, but our neighbours are going on five holidays a year. So actually they're better off. And it's like, yeah, it's almost like this, this topsy-turvy kind of what, what is making people feel that way. I mean, weirdly, my spending or desire to spend hasn't changed much even since I was a poorly paid journalist in my 20s. Um, <laughs> but, you know, give me a million pounds and we'll see what happens. And I'm willing to do that for the research. 
Um, we'll kind of get out there and I'll talk about it on the podcast if it happens. Um, but those are all the stories for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Martin, and sharing all your brilliant insight. How do people find you? Uh, well, firstly, Amelia, thank you um, so much. And to the whole team having me on the show, I've, this time has flown by. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, my name is Martin with a Y. Yes, it is that on the birth certificate. I'm not being poncy. It's Martin James. And if you find my website and click on articles, you'll get all of my guidance and tips on pretty much anything consumer rights issues you can think of for free. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. So as promised, I want to give a shout out to some of you guys and share some of your experiences this week. There have been loads of switching wins. So first up, Stephen, who says he's never bothered with bank switching before, but Be Clever With Your Cash has inspired him to go switch crazy. If you can't see me because you're listening on the podcast, I'm using the, the quote marks. Um, I love that, switch crazy. His credit rating has taken a bit of a hit, but he says it was near perfect anyway, and he doesn't rely on credit as a retired homeowner. He started in March and has made £550 already and is waiting for the rest, which should take him up to £1,000. Amazing. Oh my God, it's so good to hear that uh, you've been inspired by being clever with your cash. Um, and wow, a thousand pounds already is really, really amazing. Um, would say, I know you don't necessarily rely on your credit score, but for everyone else, do be mindful of when you are making multiple applications for current accounts um, in quick succession, um, because the hard check is done when there is an overdraft facility um, and that could have an impact on your credit score. Next one, John is on a similar flex, getting the £200 switch bonus from Nationwide and is also waiting on £100 from a recent TSB switch. He's also opened a second Chase savings account after it launched the 5.1% rate and moved all his Chase savings into it for the extra 1%. I did the same um, and hopefully uh, everyone else did as well. The extra 1% is a significant increase, um, but we do know it's not going to last forever. It does end in January next year. And just be mindful that the underlying rate, because it's the 1% is the bonus rate, the underlying rate may and probably will change before that. Next one, Julie completed two bank switches this month and it's her first time. So she got £175 each from First Direct and Lloyd's. She says she can't do the nationwide one as she's not a customer, but wonders if it's worthwhile being a customer with them for future offers. I would say there's definitely no harm in becoming a nationwide customer because we we kind of know the criteria for getting the fairer share payments because they've been quite similar the last few years. Um, and there's so there's always a chance that it will be the same next year. You, If we go by what's happened in previous years, you'll need a current account and you'll have to use it actively and a savings account or a mortgage. Now the mortgage is a bit more of a commitment and you might actually find there's better deals for you, but it's straightforward enough to open up the current account and the savings accounts. And um, we've got more details of the kind of the criteria and who got it this year. So it might be worth having a read there. Pete, last one. I used to be really financially savvy back 15 years ago, regularly stoozing and making money from switches. But then children came along and life took over and we ended up just having a single bank account each with one joint account. Recently, I found a love for being savvy with our finances again. And now my partner and I have opened and switched 16 bank accounts between us since April, all of which offered some kind of incentive. It was a struggle to find enough direct debits for all of them, but we managed it. Already received £235 so far with potentially up to £1,300 further to come in the next month or so. I love this because Pete's really talked us through his journey and, you know, there's no shame in streamlining or simplifying your finances when life gets busy. And it's probably better to rather than getting caught up with something like stoozing and run the risk of overspending or forgetting to switch cards at the end of the 0% period. Um, but also welcome back. Um, 16 switches is amazing and well done for jumping through all the hoops to get the incentives. One of the challenges many people find is having enough direct debits to qualify for the switching bonus. But we do have an article of how to hack this on the website. Do please keep these coming in. We love hearing about your experiences, um, both good and bad. And that is it for this week. So thank you so much for joining us. If you want to read the articles we've spoken about today, you can find them at becleverwithyourcash.com or in the show notes. And we will be back with another show on Tuesday. So see you all then.